The objective of this lecture is to continue the study of non-coplanar impulsive orbit transfer. Now this is part two. And the key results that are going to be developed in this lecture are as follows. The first key result is going to be to determine the location on an elliptic orbit where it is most efficient to perform a cranking impulse and the second key result is going to be to determine a two impulse orbit transfer between non-coplanar circular orbits So let's get at the first part of this, which is to determine the location on an elliptic orbit where it is most efficient to perform a cranking impulse. So let's consider an elliptic orbit. So clearly an elliptic orbit, if it has any amount of eccentricity that's significant, has a much larger apoapsis radius than it does periapsis radius. So RA is bigger than RP and if E is large or reasonably large then RA will generally be much much bigger than RP. They're not going to be that close to each other. So if we look at where on the orbit is the spacecraft moving the slowest. So we know that the velocity at apoapsis, or speed at apoapsis, is, is less than the speed at periapsis. And if E is reasonably large, again, we make the same, the same uh, statement reasonably large, then VA will actually be much, much less than VP. Now, let's recall what a cranking impulse is. Let's recall this uh, structure of a cranking impulse. So recall that a cranking impulse, delta V, is equal to 2V times the sine of theta over 2, where theta is the cranking angle and V is the speed of the spacecraft at the point on the orbit where the cranking impulse is applied. And for completeness, we can actually say delta V is equal to the magnitude of the actual vector impulse. And the vector impulse has the feature that if this is the pre-impulse velocity, 
vi minus and vi plus is the post impulse velocity, then the vector that takes me between those two is delta vi. And the assumption, if we recall the assumption, the assumption is that a cranking impulse only rotates the orbit plane, which means that the magnitude of vi minus is equal to the magnitude of vi plus which I'm calling V, which is the same as that speed that I uh, alluded to earlier. Now, if we look at, connect this back to the, uh, the idea of apoapsis and periapsis, so because VA is less than VP, that implies the following. It implies that delta V will be smaller at apoapsis, or I should say when performed at apoapsis, than it would be when performed at periapsis. But we also know the following. Also, we know that the speed is smallest at apoapsis. So that means the following. So then, for a given cranking angle, Theta, the smallest delta V from a cranking impulse, or I should say a rising from a cranking impulse, will occur at apoapsis. So that's important. So that means that if we want to get the most efficiency out of a cranking impulse, which is going to change the, which is going to rotate the orbit plane, then we want to do that maneuver at apoapsis. So now what we're going to do is we're going to combine this idea. So this is the key result, which is the first key result which is that a cranking impulse should be performed at the apoapsis of an orbit. But that's only for the case where we're doing a pure crank. So the question then becomes, what happens if we're doing a pure, cr uh, not just a pure crank, but we're actually going to rotate the orbit plane and we're also going to change the energy. Now this is, this changes the impulse a little bit, all right, which is that suppose now that it is desired to perform an impulsive maneuver that simultaneously changes the orbit plane and changes the energy. So what does an impulse like that look like? So this is a combined rotation and energy change impulse. That's what this is called. And it looks as follows. Is that instead of
this velocity v minus simply being rotated, it's actually also either elongated or made shorter, but in this case I'm going to diagram it as vi plus as being longer. So this delta v is the change in the velocity due to this combination impulse that does a uh, that rotates the orbit plane and also changes the energy. Now I'm going to still call this angle theta because it is still a cranking angle but this is not a pure cranking impulse. So if we actually look at the result here we can actually see the following is that suppose we say so we let and we're going to do this we're going to say delta v i in magnitude is equal to delta v that's what we normally do and we're going to say v minus is equal to the magnitude of v i minus and v plus is equal to the magnitude of v i plus now if you look at the, the geometry you'll actually see that from the law of cosines we have that delta v squared is going to equal v minus squared plus v plus squared minus 2 v minus v plus times the cosine of the angle between them. So of course delta v is just equal to the square root of delta v squared but I'm just going to leave it in the square form. So this is the delta v associated with a combined energy change and rotation impulse. So delta v is then just equal to delta v squared to the one half, which is just equal to the square root of delta v squared. But I don't want to write that whole thing out. Well, OK, I'll just write the whole thing out just because it's probably just as easy to do it once. So now we know that, that that's the uh, that's the that's the delta v associated with a uh, with a combined energy change and cranking and uh, orbit orbit plane rotation impulse. So this is one. This is this is the uh, the impulse that I referred to at the top of this page, which is a combined rotation and energy change impulse. So that is associated with the diagram that I've got. Now we're going to use these two concepts to be able to design and and uh, and an orbit transfer between two non-coplanar circular orbits. So now let's talk about, so this is another key result, which is that the delta V from a combined orbit plane rotation and energy change impulse is given as, and I'm just going to restate what I just stated before because I just want to want to make sure that we have this key result identified clearly. So that's the second key result. Now we're going to take these two key results and we're going to use them to be able to develop a two impulse orbit transfer between non-coplanar circular orbits. So this is what we're going to use. So we're going to use the two results to develop a two impulse orbit transfer between non-coplanar circular orbits. Now, this is a it's an interesting excursion to be able to do this, but let's uh, let's figure out how we're going to actually do this transfer. So, in order to do this, I'm going to I'm going to create a diagram and we're going to try to refer back to this diagram as much as possible as we're constructing it. But imagine I have two circular orbits. So here's my first circular orbit. Now, the radius of this orbit is going to be is going to be defined as 
r1. So there's my first circle. And I have a second circular orbit. Now, now these circular orbits are a little bit, perspective-wise, a little bit hard to, to draw because they're not they're not going to look like circles when we actually draw them. They're going to look like ellipses, but they're, it's because I'm doing this in three dimensions, and I want to make sure that as I do it, I, I make this as clearly circular as I possibly can. But it's not, it's not going to be the easiest thing in the world to, to make this like completely look like a circle, but I'll try my best. Okay, there we go. So now I'm going to lay down a set of coordinates here. And these are your standard uh, planet-centered inertial coordinates, I, X, I, Y, I, Z. And we're going to put a few things on the diagram. First is that the radius of the first orbit is going to be R1. So this distance is R1. The radius of the second orbit is R2. Because remember, these are circular orbits. So this is R2. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put down the two angular momenta associated with these two orbits. There's the angular momentum of the first orbit. I'm going to call that H1i. The angular momentum of the second orbit is going to be this vector. And it's going to be a bigger, it's going to be a, the energy, the energy is larger on that orbit because, because the, uh, the, uh, the spacecraft is further away. So this is H2i. Now, in addition to that, I'm going to label the two inclination angles. So the first inclination angle is the angle from IZ to H1. That inclination angle is I1. The inclination angle from IZ to H2 is this inclination, or is this, this inclination angle right here. That's I2. And then finally, the angle between H1 and H2, that is actually going to be my cranking angle, which is going to be the one listed as, as shown. So to make this a little bit clearer, call this I2. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use this information to be able to construct an orbit transfer. Now, what this orbit transfer is going to look like is as follows, is that I'm going to label this transfer orbit in red so that I have a different color associated with it. But I'm going to go from the first orbit to the second orbit. In order to be able to go from the first to the second orbit, there has to be a point on the first orbit where I start the transfer. I'm going to call that, I'm going to label that point here. And I'm going to move on an elliptic transfer orbit that's going to take me over to the final or final point, which I'm going to label as so. I, I put those in opposite directions on purpose because I want to be able to highlight the fact that certain features are going to are going to be are going to be present when uh, when I do this transfer. Now, here's how this is going to work: is that this is going to be a two impulse transfer. So there has to be a first delta v, which is a delta v that takes me out of the first orbit. This delta v I'm going to label delta v one, and the second delta v is the one that puts me into this final orbit, which I'm going to label delta v2. Now, remember, the inclinations of these two, of these two orbits are different. So orbit 1, the key features are that its radius is r1, and the inclination angle is i1. This is orbit, I should label, this is orbit 1. And this is orbit 2. It has a radius r2 and an inclination angle i2. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on here a couple of things. I'm going to add to this diagram as I go, which is that these two impulses, so there are two impulses. Now remember that if you look at the transfer, you'll see that the periapsis of the transfer orbit, or the radius of periapsis, is r1. But the apo, apoapsis radius of the transfer orbit is r2, which means that the first impulse, because it's going to occur at periapsis of the transfer orbit, should not change the inclination, because we just got through showing that it's more efficient to change the inclination at apoapsis than it is to change the inclination at periapsis. So delta v1, which is the first impulse, raises, 
apoapsis from R1 to R2, but does not change the orbit plane. So that means no crank is performed at all at using delta V1. But delta V2, somehow we have to change the orbit plane because, of, because these two orbits are not in the same plane. They have different inclinations. And so because we have to change the orbit plane, delta V2 has to do two things. It raises the periapsis from R1 to R2 and also changes the orbit plane. So, so this does not change the orbit plane, but this does change the orbit plane. So now what we have to do is we have to figure out what are these what are these different impulses. So in order to be able to see how this works is we have to understand one basic construct and that is what's called the line of intersection. So the line of intersection is a line, of course it's called the line of intersection so it would be a line. It's is a line or equivalently a direction that is common to both orbits. Now why is this important? Well, both orbits. Now, it is really important that we, we, uh, we understand why this line of intersection is important. The orbit transfer has to start at a point that lies on the line of intersection and it also has to end at a point that lies on the line of intersection because if it doesn't start on the line of intersection it won't be a point that starts in a location that is on both orbits and it won't terminate it and the line of intersection it has to end on the line of intersection because otherwise it won't terminate at a point on the second orbit so this is really important is that the transfer must start and terminate on the line of intersection. Otherwise, it's not a feasible transfer. It's the only way it can be a feasible transfer. So the first thing we need to do is we need to compute the line of intersection or the or equivalently the direction of intersection so that we we can figure out a direction that's common to, to uh, that's common to both orbits so we know that whatever so let's call this direction of intersection so i'm going to say let l be the direction of intersection which is equivalently just the line of intersection cuz we're dealing with a vector but it's a uh, It's going to be a unit vector, so that's why I called it the direction of intersection. So if it's common to both orbits, it means it has to lie in both orbit planes. So L must lie in the orbit plane of both orbits. So that implies that it has to be orthogonal to the first angular momentum and it also has to be orthogonal to the second specific angular momentum. If it's not, then it's not going to lie in the orbit plane of both orbits. Now, we can actually figure out this line of intersection simply from this condition right, right here. That implies that L has to equal H1I crossed with H2I divided by the magnitude of H1I crossed with H2I. Well, why is that? Let's think about it. So if I take L and I dot it with H1, 
it has to be orthogonal to h1. Well, h1 crossed with h2 is orthogonal to h1, and it's also orthogonal to h2, so therefore it satisfies the condition that h1 dotted with l is 0 and h2 dotted with l is also 0. So this is the direction of intersection, or the line of intersection. So now we're going to use this to be able to construct the this transfer that uh, that we are about to show this show its the key structure. So this is the line of intersection. Now, what we can do is, in order to be able to make this tractable, we're going to have to define some some quantities that will be useful in the process of doing this. Well, we know first of all that delta v1 must be tangent to orbit 1. So as a result, it has to lie in the direction that's tangent. Well, what is the direction that's tangent at orbit 1? So we know that delta v1 must lie in the direction h1i crossed with l because l is orthogonal to h1 so h1 crossed with l has to be tangent so that means that and we're going to call this we're going to call this direction uh, u1 so we're going to say let u1 be the direction of delta v1i. So then that implies that u1 has to equal h1 crossed with l all divided by the magnitude of h1i crossed with l. So there's the there's the first uh, but because because these two directions are orthogonal this can just be written as h1i crossed with l all divided by the magnitude of h1 because h1 and l are orthogonal l is a unit vector so as a result that just gives me u1 now we can actually figure out what the first delta v is so we know that again delta v1 does not change inclination So as a result of that, that means that these two vectors, v1 minus and v1 plus, which form delta v1, have to be in the same direction. So that means that if we write this out, delta v1i, which has to equal v1 plus i minus v1 minus i, has to equal v1 plus, which is the speed, times u1 minus v1 minus, also times u1, because they have to be in the same direction. Well, v1 minus is just equal to my initial circular speed. v1 plus has to equal the square root of mu times the square root of 2 over r1 minus 1 over a. Now, that's because if we go back to the diagram, you'll see that this point here, which I'm, I'll label in blue to be able to make it a little, little bit more prominent, that's the point where I have to start the transfer. And this direction, that direction is the line of intersection. That has to be the line of intersection because it's orthogonal to h1 and h2. That means it lies in both orbit planes. It has to be on the orb on the first orbit, and it has to it has to be on this on this line such that it intersects both both uh, both orbits. So this this line intersects both orbits. You see, it intersects the orbit at the periapsis of the transfer orbit, and it also intersects the orbit on the other side. The, other, the second orbit on the other side. Hence, it's called the line of intersection. But notice that the direction that I've got here, which I'll label a little bit more pronounced, this direction is actually negative L. So that, that'll, that'll be really important when we actually do the remainder of this transfer. So now we can actually figure out delta V1.
which is that delta v1, let's go back to, let's go back to the uh, color I was using before, which is that delta v1i is then equal to v1 plus minus v1 minus times u1, which implies that delta v1, which is the magnitude of delta v1i, is just equal to v1 plus minus v1 minus, where v1 plus and v1 minus are the values that I just wrote down here. Now, if you look, you'll see that a, of course, has to be equal to r1 plus r2 all divided by 2. That's the semi-major axis of the transfer orbit. So a is equal to the semi-major axis of the transfer orbit. And again, just as a reminder, a is equal to r1 plus r2 all divided by 2. Now that's the first impulse. Now the second impulse is applied on the other side. So if I actually look and see where the second impulse is applied, it's e most easily shown with a diagram, which is that if this is my transfer orbit, so here's my elliptic transfer orbit, delta v1 didn't change the orbit plane. So there's delta v1. And then I move along this transfer orbit, and I get to this point right here. So actually what I'm going to do, instead of labeling delta v1, I'm actually going to label this as, this is going to be v1 plus. So that's the velocity after I apply the first delta v. So, but it didn't change the orbit plane. So I get over here, and I've got v, I'm going to make this a little shorter because I'm at apoapsis. So this is v2 minus, this is the velocity just before I apply the second delta v. That's v2 minus. Now you'll see that this direction right here, that direction is u1. That's the direction I just computed by, uh, by figuring out all of this uh, all of this information right here. That's the direction u1 that's sitting in this equation. So I know that this v1 plus is equal to v1 plus times u1. But v2 minus is in the exact opposite di direction. So that means v2 minus has to equal its speed, v2 minus, times u2. Um, but this actually, I'm going to refer to this as actually just minus u1, because I'm going to, I'll use u2 for something else. So this gives v2 minus is equal to minus v2 minus times u1, because this direction right here is minus u1. So that's my pre-impulse velocity before, that means before I apply the second delta v. But the second delta v, so delta v2, changes the orbit plane and changes the orbital energy. So that means that this delta v2, if I look at it, satisfies the condition of a combined energy change and orbit rotation impulse. So this is v2 minus, this is v2 plus, and there is my delta v2. This is delta v2. Now, the angle is this cranking angle. So now I know how to compute delta v2. I can figure out what these directions are. So we need to figure out, we already have v2 minus, we need v2 plus. So v2 plus is equal to the speed at that point times the direction I'm going to call u2. But now let's look at the diagram again and we'll see what that direction u2 has to be. Well, the direction u2 has to be one that finally puts me into this final circular orbit. But if I look, you'll see that the direction u2 is going to be constructed from the following information, which is that u2 has to be tangent, is tangent. So let's, let's, let's write this uh, Let's write this this way. 
where u2 is tangent to orbit 2 at the apoapsis of the transfer orbit. So if I'm at apoapsis of the transfer orbit, then that means that the position at where I am is that tangent vector has got to lie in the direction along H2. Let's write it this way. It's got to be equal to H2 crossed with minus L all divided by the magnitude of H2 crossed with minus L. Now, let's, let's simplify this expression first and we'll see what's going on. So I can factor out the negative sign. So I've got H2I crossed with L all divided by the magnitude of H2I crossed with L, which gives that U2 is equal to minus H2I crossed with L all divided by the magnitude of H2. Because again, H2 and L are, orth are orthogonal to one another. So the magnitude of H2 crossed with L is just the magnitude of H2 times the magnitude of L. And the, 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 sign, uh, the sign of the angle between them is, uh, is pi over 2. So it just gives me 1. So that, uh, that's the result that I get. Now, why is it in that direction? Well, it's because it has to be in the direction opposite kind of the direction opposite u1, but it's not, it can't be opposite u1 because I've rotated the orbit plane. I've rotated the orbit plane by that amount, by that cranking angle uh, theta. So as a result, it has to be in the direction of the final angular momentum crossed with the negative line of intersection, and that gives me the direction u2. So now that, that gives me that v2 plus is then equal to the speed v2 plus times u2. So that tells me that delta V2 I is then equal to V2 plus U2 minus V2 minus times U1 because that's the, that's the, uh, that's the direction that, uh, that I've got. And if you look, you'll actually see that the uh, V2 minus is minus V2. So it's actually, it's actually this. It's a plus. So... So that gives me the uh, that gives me the direction, and and you can see that that comes from the fact that v2 minus has to be in the direction of negative u1, and then v2 plus has to be in the direction of u2. Okay, so now we actually have an expression for this, and this, of course, an easier way to just write this is just going to be equal to v2 plus i minus v2 minus i. So now we actually have the second delta v. But because that second delta v is a, is an, is a uh, combined energy change and orbit plane change impulse, we also know the following. So we also know that delta v2 squared is equal to v2 minus squared plus v2 plus squared minus 2 v2 minus v2 plus times the cosine of the cranking angle. Now what we have to do is we have to figure out what is the cranking angle. So what is the cranking angle theta? Well, we can figure this out from the two angular momenta. We know that h1i dotted with h2i is equal to the magnitude of h1 times the magnitude of h2 times the cosine of theta. And that comes again going back to the diagram. If we go back to the diagram, you'll see that the angle between h1 and h2 is right there. It's the angle theta. So as a result, we can actually use this now to just be able to compute the angle theta. So that tells us that the cosine of theta 
is equal to h1i dotted with h2i all divided by the magnitude of h1i times the magnitude of h2i and that means that theta is equal to the inverse cosine of h1i dotted with h2i all divided by the magnitude of h1i times the magnitude of h2i. So now we have all the information to be able to perform the orbit transfer. So if you summarize all this information, you can actually see that in order to perform the orbit transfer, you need a few pieces of, inter of information. First, you need that line of intersection. So it's really important that you establish what the line of intersection is. So in order to perform the orbit transfer, the first thing you need is you need to know the line of intersection. The orbit transfer starts on that line of intersection. So the starting point for the orbit transfer, so the start of the transfer, is at a position I'm going to call R1, which is equal to R1 times L. The terminus of the transfer is at a position R2, which is equal to minus R2 times L. So if we actually summarize the information now, we can actually see that delta V1 I, which is equal to V1 plus I minus minus V1 minus I is equal to the speed, the post impulse speed times U1 minus the pre impulse speed times U1, which is equal to V1 plus minus V1 minus times U1, where U1 is equal to H1 crossed with L all divided by the magnitude of h1 crossed with l, which as I said simplifies to h1 crossed with l all divided by the magnitude of h1. So that's that's u1. And we also have that v1 plus, or v1 minus, let's do that first, is the square root of mu over r1, and v1 plus is equal to the square root of mu times the square root of 2 over r1 minus 1 over a, where a is equal to r1 plus r2 all divided by 2. Now that's the first impulse. The second impulse, so again I'm just summarizing all this so we can see it like uh, in sort of in one place rather than it kind of being in the derivation part. This is equal to v2 plus i minus v2 minus i, which is equal to v2 plus times u2 plus v2 minus times u1. And that's just because we recall that v2 minus i is equal to minus v2 minus times u1 and v2 plus is equal to speed times u2, where we already computed u1. So u2 is equal to h2 crossed with minus l, all divided by the magnitude of h2 crossed with minus l, which simplifies to minus h2i crossed with l, all divided by the magnitude of h2. I. And we also note that the, just like we did over here, you know, we've got this, uh, this impulse. So here we can actually write down that delta V1 or delta, delta V1 is equal to the magnitude of delta V1 I, which is equal to V1 plus minus V1 minus where they were given earlier. And the the uh, the speeds that we have on the well actually let's uh, let's do this let's complete this this impulse first so we can uh, second impulse which is that v two minus is equal to the square root of mu times the square root of two over r two 
minus 1 over a, and v2 plus is equal to the square root of mu over r2. And then finally, we have that, that uh, delta v2 squared is equal to v2 minus squared plus v2 plus squared minus 2 v2 minus v2 plus times the cosine of theta, where theta is equal to the cosine inverse of h1i dotted with h2i, all divided by the magnitude of h1 times the magnitude of h2. And we can actually write the, uh, the actual vector impulses using the expressions that are given up above. So that gives us the full orbit transfer that would that actually gets us to that gets us through the uh, through the two the two impulse orbit transfer between non coplanar circular orbits which starts on the line of intersection ends on the line of intersection and the speeds pre impulse and post impulse are given as I've described and the uh, and the impulses themselves are given in the manner in which I've shown here. So that gives us a way of being able to construct everything for this, uh, for this orbit transfer case. And later on, what we're going to do is we're going to use this uh, information to be able to solve for uh, impulsive orbit transfers, transfers of this kind. Now, you can actually see that before we finish this uh, lecture, that this type of a transfer is often referred to as what's called a Holman type transfer. Now, because it's almost a Holman transfer, right? This is what this is what we've actually we've actually constructed. It's a Holman type transfer because it's a two impulse transfer where the second impulse changes both the orbit plane and the energy. See, in a, in a regular Hohmann transfer, you only change the energy because you don't change the orbit plane. But here you're doing both. You're changing the, the orbit plane and the energy, but you're doing the orbit plane rotation with the second impulse. You're not doing it with the first impulse. The first impulse only increases the energy of the orbit. It doesn't do anything else if you're going from a smaller orbit to a to a larger orbit. So that basically summarizes the entire uh, entirety of a uh, two impulse orbit transfer with a plane change. And now we can actually construct some fairly sophisticated orbit transfers using this basic construct of a two impulse orbit transfer with a plane change. And that's where we will stop this lecture.